This lesson is on lichen planus. So we're going to talk about what this condition is. We're also going to talk about some of the pathophysiology behind why it occurs. And then we're going to talk about some of the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So lichen planus is an inflammatory dermatological condition involving lesions of the skin and the mucous membranes. So mucous membranes including inside the mouth, and then certain parts of the body on the skin can be affected, and even the nails can be affected. And we're going to talk about these in more detail later on in this lesson. Now, the cause of this condition is often unknown, which means that it is often idiopathic, but some causes can be medications. And in this case, if it was due to a medication, it would be considered drug-induced lichen planus. There are a variety of forms of this condition we're going to talk about in the next slide. Now, it's estimated to affect approximately 0.2 to 1% of the general population. And the oral lichen planus form, which we're going to talk about later on in this lesson in more detail, this is actually going to be the most common form of this condition. And again, here is oral lichen planus. And this is estimated to affect up to 1 to 4% of the general population. Now, the onset of this condition occurs between the ages of 30 and 60, and females outnumber males with regards to this condition. Let's talk about the different forms of lichen planus. One form is going to be cutaneous lichen planus, where there's going to be lesions on the skin itself. There can be mucosal or oral lichen planus, which is again going to affect the oral cavity and some other mucous membranes on the body. We'll talk a bit more about this later on as well. Lichen planopolaris can also be another form where it affects the scalp. Lichen planus of the nails can be another form where the nails are affected. Lichen planus pigmentosus can also be another form. And then there can be drug-induced lichen planus, which is caused by medication and oftentimes can look like these other forms. So this form is often indistinguishable from other forms. Let's talk about some of the proposed pathophysiology behind why this condition occurs. It is likely due to an autoimmune mechanism. Now, the entire pathophysiology behind this condition is not entirely understood. So what is believed to happen is that there is an exposure to some antigen or a medication or a virus. With regards to the medications that can induce this condition, it has been associated with the use of ACE inhibitors, NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen use, beta blockers, thiazide diuretics, and tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitors. So those are the medications that have been associated with the onset of this condition. And there is a particular virus that is associated with this condition, and that is hepatitis C. This is going to be very important as oftentimes individuals with hepatitis C are five to six times more likely to have this condition. So there's likely a very important pathophysiological association between hepatitis C infection and this condition. What happens is when there's exposure to one of these medications or hepatitis C or some other antigen, this leads to abnormal CD8 T cell activation. So CD8 T cells become abnormally active. And what this does is it leads to particular lesions in particular parts of the body. And another possible mechanism as to why oral lichen planus may occur is through contact with particular metals from particular cavity fillings. So if a cavity filling contains some metal like copper or gold or mercury, this can lead to a contact reaction inside the mouth. And this can lead to oral lichen planus in some patients. So I also want to mention that here as well. Now, before we actually get into what the lesions look like, let's talk about where they occur on the body. So oftentimes they're going to occur on the wrists and the ankles. These are going to be two important areas where cutaneous lesions can occur. We can also see it on the lower back and the scalp. We again mentioned that lichen planopolaris is a form of this condition that can affect the scalp. And then there is mucosal lichen planus or oral lichen planus if it affects the mouth. So the mucosal membranes in the mouth or around the penis or vagina can also be affected with these lesions as well. So these are going to be very important areas where lesions from lichen planus can occur. And then, as I mentioned before, the nails can also be affected in some forms of this condition. And then what is going to be found with these lesions is that if they affect one side of the body, they're going to affect the other side as well. So they're going to be bilateral or symmetrical. So if you see it on one wrist, you're going to see it on the other wrist. Or if you see it on one ankle, you're going to see it on the other ankle. So again, symmetric, bilateral, and it's going to affect these areas on the body. Let's talk about what the lesions actually look like. So here is an example of lichen planus on 
the legs. So oftentimes you're going to be a papule or a plaque. So a papule is a raised skin lesion that is less than 10 millimeters in diameter. And a plaque is a raised skin lesion that is greater than 10 millimeters in diameter. So it can either be a papule or a plaque. When looking at the lesion, the top of the lesion is often flat. So it has a characteristic look to it, a flat top lesion. And these lesions are often well demarcated. So there is a strong change from the lesion to the surrounding skin. So there's a strong, clear border. These lesions are oftentimes going to be violaceous, which means that they're going to be oftentimes purple in coloration. They can be red in some cases, but they're oftentimes going to be purple. And they're going to be polygonal shaped. So they're not going to be circles or ovals. They're going to be polygonal. And they're going to be puritic, which means that they're going to be itchy. So they're going to be flat-topped papule plaques that are itchy, and oftentimes they're going to be purple in coloration in those areas of the body we talked about before. Here's another image of what they can look like as well. Now, there are some other details with regards to these skin lesions. One of them is Wickham's striae. Wickham's striae is what is located in this image here. Wickham's striae is not always present. It is a reticulated gray-white lesion, so it's a reticulated white lesion on top of the lesions we looked at before. It essentially looks like white or gray lines. They are going to be firm to palpation. So if you actually touch them, they're going to be firm. And if you see Wickham striae, it is pathognomonic for lichen planus, which means that if you do see it, the patient does have lichen planus. So again, Wickham striae is very important to remember. What can also be noted in patients with this condition is what is known as Kubner phenomenon. Kubner's phenomenon is an onset of new lesions in areas of cutaneous injury or trauma. So if there is a part of the body that is not affected and the patient has an injury to that area or even scratches that area, that can lead to a new onset of lichen planus cutaneous lesions. So this is a phenomenon that can occur in this condition as well. And as I mentioned before, this condition can affect multiple areas of the body one of those is going to be the nails. So if the nails are affected by lichen planus, they can look like this. So they can have longitudinal lines on the nail surface and a pterygium can form in some cases. So a pterygium is what is noted here. This is a pterygium. With regards to lesions in the mouth, this would be considered an oral lichen planus. This is what it can look like oftentimes. It can look like a white and reticulated lesion and oftentimes a milky white papule is what is going to be described. Again, it's oftentimes going to be reticular. There are multiple forms of oral lichen planus and the reticular form is the most common form. These lesions may be red in coloration and they can either be asymptomatic, which means that they don't have any symptoms at all, or they can be painful or burning. These are actually going to be some of the more common lesions found in patients. They can occur in roughly 50 to 60% of patients with lichen planus. And in some cases, they may be the only finding. So we talked about oral lichen planus being the most common form, and this is going to be some of the more common lesions that are noted with patients who have lichen planus. And here is another image. Now, the scalp can also be affected in what is known as lichen planopolaris. This can be a scarring alopecia, and what happens here is that there is perifollicular hyperkeratosis, and you can see that there are going to be patches of alopecia that can occur from this condition. Now, before we move on to how this condition is diagnosed, I want to talk about a way to remember what the lesions look like in this condition. And the way to remember it is by the mnemonic six Ps. So if we were to look at this lesion here, oftentimes the lesion is going to be purple, so that is one P. It's going to be a papule or a plaque, as we mentioned before. It's going to be pruritic, which means that it's going to be itchy. It's going to be polygonal, which is going to be the shape of the lesion. It's going to be peripheral, which means that it's oftentimes going to affect the wrists and the ankles, and it can affect the penis. And this is a way to remember that mucosal membranes are affected by lichen planus. So this is a quick way to remember the lesions in lichen planus in a way to think about this condition if you do see these types of lesions. Now let's talk about how this condition is diagnosed. This may be a clinical diagnosis. We talked about if a clinician sees Wickham's striae that is pathognomonic for this condition. Oftentimes though, a biopsy of the lesion can be helpful in determining that this is lichen planus. And then if there is particular risk factors or if there's a thought that 
this may be associated with hepatitis C infection, it's also important to assess for hepatitis C infection. So these are a few different ways that this condition can be found or determined or diagnosed. How do clinicians actually treat this condition? Some cases actually spontaneously resolve within one to two years on their own. However, oral lichen planus can be a chronic condition, so this is more likely to be a chronic condition if it is affecting the mouth or the oral cavity. When the lesions do resolve, there can be residual hyperpigmentation, which is often going to be gray to brown in coloration in the area of the previous lesion. Because this is a pruritic or itchy condition, antipruritic treatments can often be helpful, so certain creams can help with the itching. Corticosteroids are oftentimes going to be helpful as well, so starting off with topical corticosteroids first. And if that doesn't work, if the condition becomes refractory and topical steroids don't work, intralesional corticosteroids with, for instance, triamcinolone can be utilized. And then if there is a very, very severe case where there's diffuse lesions, oral prednisone for short periods of time may be used as well. And then if it is a refractory case, if many of these have been tried and nothing helps, there are a few other treatment modalities that can be utilized. Phototherapy may be helpful for some patients. Metronidazole may also be helpful and sulfazalazine can also be another treatment as well. And then oral retinoids can be used for the erosive oral lichen planus form. So if there is erosive oral lichen planus, oral retinoids may be helpful. And then in some cases, immunosuppressants may be used as well. And then another important thing to think about is removal or replacement of old cavity fillings. We talked about copper and mercury and certain metals from cavity fillings that can lead to oral lichen planus. So it may be important to actually replace those cavity fillings with metals or another substance that does not lead to lichen planus. So again, that's something else to think about as well. If you want to learn more about other dermatology conditions, please check out my dermatology playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.